Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. Today we are joined by neurosurgeon Dr. Ali Biden, who is a professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. His clinical practice focuses on degenerative disorders of the spine, spinal tumors, and complex reconstruction and restoration of the spine. Dr. Biden, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. There can be numerous causes for pain that is related to the spine. Some of the deformities and other related to natural degeneration occur with aging. And now that I'm in my mid-60s, I feel like I'm aging faster than ever. Can you describe some of these deformities and how they are managed? Thank you very much for the question. As the body ages, uh, there are certain uh, changes that take place in the joints that make up the skeletal system. These changes start to impinge upon the neural elements that are encased by the joints and by the skeletal system. You hear a lot about bone spurs that would develop, and this is something that we would see in any joint. As joints age, they become degenerated, and the response to that is that we would have bone spurs that starts coming from the space, the joint space itself. And if you're talking about the spine, The spine is surrounded by bone, which is a defense mechanism. Just like the brain is completely encased by the skull, just like the heart is completely encased by the ribcage, the spinal cord and the nerves are completely encased by bone. Now, the bone that encases the spinal cord, if it were not mobile, then it would not degenerate. But the way that the body is made is that you do need to move your neck and you do need to move your lower back. And as such, rather than having one long tube surrounded by bone, which doesn't degenerate, we have joints. And as such, as we get older, we usually develop significant pain in these joints. And that's usually in the neck and the lower back, not the middle back because the middle back is immobile and does not move, and that's attached to the ribcage, and as such, we have very little movement there. So unless we have a compression fracture from osteoporosis or, you know, God forbid, a tumor that has gone to the thoracic spine, most of the pain that one would have that's attributed to age-related degenerative changes is seen either in the neck or in the lower back. Now, the job of a neurosurgeon is to decipher and try to tell where the pain is being generated by, which joint is causing that. We use uh, a lot of imaging to help us with this, CAT scan, MRI, flexion extension x-rays, history from the patient, what they're telling us, where the pain is, what we find on the physical examination, as well as at times we would use diagnostic injections in order to see if that's the joint that's generating the pain. And usually if that's the case and the joint is very degenerated, the solution is to eliminate that joint by fusing it. So a joint is a space where two bones come together and as it degenerates, we can eliminate the joint. Now, it's best not to do it to all the joints in the spine because that would render a person completely immobile, but at times we have to do that. And degenerative changes are almost as predictable as gray hair. As we get older, these degenerative changes happen. When the neural elements that are being encased by these joints that we have in the skeletal system, vertebral bodies, when the neural elements become impinged, then a person would present with what's known colloquially as sciatica. So that is pain that usually travels in a nerve distribution. Sciatica typically talks about pain that's in the buttocks, and then it would travel down either the back of the thigh or the front of the thigh and down the leg. And that's a pretty debilitating pain, and that's from a nerve that's compressed. So as 
Nerve surgeons, our job is to decompress that. And oftentimes, those patients end up moving on to very productive lives with uh, minimal residual pain. So I think if we accept the fact then that when we age, this is part of the natural process that our spine is going to do. What about for those that are under the age of 50 and are experiencing some degeneration in the spine? How can we go about having those individuals appropriately diagnosed as well as treated, whether it be neck pain or back pain that's causing their problem? That's an excellent question, Lily, because we have a very athletic society. We have a society that's extremely active. And at times, we sometimes push the limits of what the bodies are meant to handle. And this can lead to failure across that segment. And usually, it's either a big synovial cyst, but more commonly, it's usually a disc herniation. So a disc herniation usually... We see it in younger folks rather than older folks, because as we get older, the disc is usually protected a bit by the degeneration that takes place and the collapse that takes place across the disc space. But in younger folks, the discs are quite high and they're robust. And if someone has a high tolerance for pain and they overdo things, the result is usually a herniation of a disc. Now, If a disc herniates in the neck, we have three things that can happen. Most of the time, it goes away by itself. At least the symptoms go away by themselves. And this is why we never rush into surgery on someone who can tolerate the inconvenience and the pain and hasn't had injections, physical therapy, and other conservative modalities. And they don't have weakness. If we have a disc herniation that's impinging upon the spinal cord or a nerve, and it's causing appreciable objective weakness, those patients need surgery. A disc herniation in the neck can cause a bruise on the spinal cord, uh, which can render uh, the person with some neurological deficits, usually numbness in both hands, balance problems. I had a patient who came to me. This person used to lecture to almost 5,000 people, and he said, every time I walk on the podium, I walk like a drunken sailor. I always felt like patients felt that I was intoxicated Ah. because balance becomes an extreme problem for those patients in addition to weakness. So those patients need to go to the operating room in order for us to decompress the spinal cord appropriately. You mentioned injections. Can you talk a little bit more about what you are injecting and where so our audience understands this isn't a shot in their arm? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, now, it's steroids are some of the best medications that we can give. However, they have a lot of side effects. In addition to the cognitive side effects that they can have, steroids can cause diabetes, they can cause ulcers, and they can cause significant decay of the bone leading to osteoporosis and bone fractures. Now, why is steroids such a good medication? Because it's an excellent anti-inflammatory. When you have an inflammation in the neck, let's say, due to a disc herniation, steroids work great. Usually, we would only give them for about six days or seven days by mouth. We try to limit that because we don't want the systemic side effects of steroids that I just mentioned. So is there a way that we can introduce steroids into the place where it hurts without giving it orally by mouth? and subjecting the patient to all the side effects that that come with them? And the answer is yes. And we have a whole specialty in medicine with whom we work very closely where they can inject the patients with usually either anesthetics or steroids or both into the what we feel is the culprit. So if someone has a C5, C6 herniation and the nerve is compressed on the right side, and they have pain shooting down their arm, then we would ask our pain managers to try to target that nerve root with a, either an epidural steroid injection or with a nerve root block too. And we use this both diagnostically and therapeutically. Tell us also about some other non-surgical treatments. I know some patients may seek out massage or go to a chiropractor, might go to uh, physical therapy perhaps, or some other 
provider that can help increase blood circulation to an area that may need it? I think that the conservative therapies play a big role because truly 90% of people with spinal disorders end up not needing surgery. And those patients can be managed by time, physical therapy, including the stretching exercises that they would teach them, uh, chiropractor manipulation, as well as injections and oral anti-inflammatory, plain old Motrin, Advil, Aleve, anything like that. What about plasma-rich therapy? Have you used that or recommended that? So the jury is still out on the efficacy of plasma enriched therapy. It's hard for us to recommend it yet because it may have some side effects. And I think further studies are needed before it becomes a mainstay of conservative management for this patient. But back to your excellent question about chiropractor manipulation. I think most chiropractors are very well versed in the uh, neurological examination, and some of the red flags that would prompt them not to either overdo the manipulation or subject someone to manipulation in the midst of a large disc, causing compression of the spinal cord out of fear of worsening the situation. But that is part of their training. I'm not opposed to chiropractor manipulation, but also the patient has to play a major role during the manipulation in telling the person doing the adjustments when it hurts and when that threshold is being breached. You definitely want to look at surgery as let's do it if we need to do it and to try to do some non-surgical treatment modalities to hopefully resolve this problem. I was reading last week that the top three reasons why a patient goes to see their primary care doctor is a cold, flu, or back pain. But I don't think, frankly, that primary care providers have been very well trained in when should they be referring to you. And I'm hoping that they aren't quick to put someone on steroids, thinking that's the magic pill to solve this problem, but to really get them into the hands of a specialist. I think patients will deal with back pain for quite some time before they'll go anywhere. So I always find if it's bad enough they wanted to see right their primary care physician, then this must be pretty intense. I think that you're absolutely correct in the sense that the disability caused by back pain has a major impact on society in terms of number of people, work hours lost, loss of productivity, and sometimes early retirement. So it is a major impediment in our society. I find that primary care physicians are extremely well-versed at getting the right people to the specialist because, as you said, Lily, it is so ubiquitous and rampant to have back pain. You really do not want to flood a neurosurgeon's office with patients who would do well if they rested for three days if they put some ice or heating pad for another four days, and if they resume their activities with a little bit of relief, and that's what happens. I think when a specialist usually gets involved at the request of a primary care physician is usually when there's some red flags involved, such as weakness, pain shooting down the leg, foot drop, shoulder drop, numbness in both hands, Symptoms that impact both legs or both arms, because usually if it's just back pain and a small disc and it's touching one nerve, the symptoms should be unilateral, not bilateral. Right. That is another big distinction factor to our colleagues in internal medicine who may be listening to us. And of course, if it starts involving dysfunction of the urinary tract system or uh-huh. the GI system. And uh-huh. so. There are certain red flags that would sway someone to do this. Or if pain stays for two, three, four weeks and it's not going away, then it's a good idea to get an imaging. In the elderly population, you have a lot of osteoporosis, especially in women. And those patients are very prone to fragility fractures of their vertebrae, which are quite painful. And that just happens because of 
either untreated, subtreated, or sometimes appropriately treated osteoporosis. The treatment for, if you want to talk a little about things that impact women more so than men, older more so than younger, and that's compression, vertebral osteoporotic compression fractures. The treatment for those patients is also preferably non-surgical because anything that we would do would involve reconstruction of the spine, and that usually requires strong bone in order for our hardware and instrumentation to be able to settle and sit properly and not move. And so, again, you're going to notice that more often than not, the answer is non-surgical. However, in the 10% of patients where they have failed conservative therapy or there's weakness, there's involvement of neurological dysfunction, there's significant impingement upon a spinal cord, we're worried, God forbid, if somebody falls, they would be at a higher risk of paralyzing themselves than that. Mm-hmm. Well, then surgery becomes an option. But I would say that most people, if pain lasts a good 10 days, I think it's a good idea to start with an MRI or other imaging studies. Sure. So what kind of spine surgery techniques are available? You've talked a little bit about spinal fusion, but I'm a big fan of minimally invasive and certainly the ability to use robotics today is something that probably our audience listening is not that familiar with. Yes. So I can tell you that minimally invasive is not new. We've had it for a good 25 years now. It continues to play a role in the management of certain patients. Unlike, let's say, minimally invasive resection of the bladder, a lot of people would present with cholecystectomy. And now it is nearly the standard of care that you would resect someone's bladder via laparoscopic surgery because the hospitalization went from seven to 10 days to one day. So in spine surgery, unfortunately, we don't have that. So almost over 75% of spine surgery performed today is done the traditional open way, number one. Number two, you are dealing with nerves. An incision that's a couple of centimeters or inches larger than usual, which affords the surgeon better visualization of extremely important nerves, without which the patient can be left with significant disabilities working. And so we always have to weigh those two things together. It is minimal is good as long as it's not at the expense of visualization. And robotic does allow us with better precision of uh, placement of hardware. And that is an evolving field. We are lucky to be helping in the evolution of this field. And as it evolves and becomes more widely used with a larger number of patients would be candidates for such procedures. I was talking to someone a few weeks ago who is going to be having lower back spinal surgery. He said, I've met now with three different doctors, and I realized that I didn't prepare in advance what kind of questions I should have asked. And he said, obviously, the number of cases that they've successfully done. And I said, you want somebody who's going to go into your back who's going to be very delicate and is going to treat your spine as if it was a hand grenade with a pin already pulled so that those nerves are protected. He said, well, there's a visual for me as I go to sleep. And I said, well, that's that's what you should be asking for. You want someone who is going to be that, certainly that delicate. I want to stop at that comment because what you're saying is absolutely important. We have a lot of data that shows there is a proportionate correlation between surgical outcome and the volume of the surgeon. So we at Johns Hopkins, if I can put in a plug for our large neurosurgical group here at Hopkins, we have super subspecialized guys. So we have neurosurgeons who are devoted to one aspect of neurosurgery, and they spend a lot of time doing it. I don't want to tell you that these guys can do some of the surgeries with their eyes closed because you don't have to do this. You truly want the person who does this on a daily basis 
scan and make sure that your surgeon is a high volume surgeon and you are being treated in a high volume place as well. Uh huh. Because uh-huh. the surgeon is as good as the people around him or her. If the surgeon does an operation and the patient does very well, but then they require to see a nephrologist or a cardiologist or an intensivist, uh, you want to make sure that everything is covered that could come up, especially things that were unforeseen before. And it's important to be in the right place for this. In looking at risks of doing spinal surgery, what types of warnings, I guess, do you explain to a patient that could happen? We're hoping that they don't, but still they've got to be on the radar that they could occur. Lily, that's another excellent question. Your best outcome is going to be the first operation because, as you know, the first operation, you don't have a lot of scar tissue. Your field is very clean and you can see the nerves, the muscle, the ligament, the bone very clearly. And as such, if done correctly, that first operation should give somebody a very good outcome. Revision surgery is always difficult because you don't know what took place the first time. Scar tissue has developed. Your field is not as homogeneously clear, and that can lead to issues. I think neurosurgeons, we pride ourselves in being nerve surgeons, so we know how to handle being around nerves. We know how much a nerve can tolerate because these surgeries do require a certain component of manipulation on the nerves or on the spinal cord. And if those elements are overly manipulated, a patient could, God forbid, wake up with weakness, whether it's a foot drop or paralysis or something. But I would say in general, uh, surgeons dealing with spine issues, especially neurosurgeons, are trained for good seven or eight years before they're out on their own how to handle nerves, how much can a nerve tolerate, how much they can't tolerate, what can you get away with. So experience is very important. The volume of the surgeon is very important because the consequences can also be problematic. Side effects, as you mentioned, of the operation can vary from a wound opening up to an infection to the need to revise the operation to, if we're operating in the neck, God forbid, the problems with the esophagus, uh, heart attacks, if you know, given the patient's uh, cardiac history. That's why sometimes we would uh, send patients for cardiology, clearance before surgery, clots in the legs, clots in the lungs, uh, pneumonia, and so on and so forth. And this is why you want to be in a place where you will be seen by a physical therapist shortly after the operation, so they get you up and about because we know that sitting around in a bed is not a good idea. There are risks to this operation, but most of the time they are very manageable. You know, in the right hands, you can be hopefully in and out. In looking at what we're able to offer within Johns Hopkins Medicine, in particular Ambulatory Surgery Center at Green Spring Station, which is exciting yes. that we've expanded our services mm-hmm. there, what are we able to accomplish for patients, downtown versus Green Spring, et cetera? There is a shift now towards doing more of these spine operations by neurosurgeons on an outpatient basis because the thought is patients recover better at home. Home, uh, believe it or not, is uh, more sterile than being in a hospital. And so I would say the majority of our operations, the big spinal fusions, the spinal reconstruction that's at times uh, needs to be done in the hospital setting. The uh, single-level discectomies, the single-level laminectomies, uh, the patients who have very few comorbidities, uh, the very healthy patients. I would say any operation that's going to be less than two hours that would require a indwelling Foley catheter to be placed or so on, can be done at Green Spring Station, which we share your excitement. It's actually a phenomenal place. My partner has done a few surgeries there. He loves it. And we are in the process of all being credentialed there as well. That's wonderful. Well, we're still dealing with COVID-19, as you know, and that's been rather disruptive to the way that we normally would be delivering Healthcare. Can you fill us in on some of the safety measures that have been put into place so that patients 
can feel more confident and less worried when they're going to come and see you or, or see one of your other colleagues. COVID-19 was a, is a terrible thing and was a terrible time and continues to be an extremely time where it challenges us. But I would say that physicians in general and Johns Hopkins in specific have stepped up to the plate and embraced telemedicine and telehealth in a way that I didn't think would be possible. This is very good for the patients, and it's also very good for the providers. I can tell you that there was almost no interruption in our ability to manage our patients and see newer patients who need neurosurgical evaluations due to telehealth. The patient doesn't have to drive from Potomac, Maryland to Baltimore, sit in traffic, park, pay for parking, wait, be registered, have their vitals taken, and then seen by the doctor. If you have a doctor's visit, you're talking about a four-hour ordeal. I would say that out of the misery of COVID came a new way for us to see patients, which is better, more efficient, less costly, and less disruptive to the patients. They can be on their phone, they can talk to a surgeon, and the surgeon can say, yes, I can help, or no, I can't help, and they move on with their day. And I think that that's very good. So that's one way that we are doing things differently than we did before COVID. The other safety measures that you are mentioning is uh, we are, and Johns Hopkins, from the beginning, we have adopted the CDC regulations and recommendations of absolute masking, cleanliness of the rooms, sanitation, as well as physical separation, social separation. And you will see that um, at the beginning, we actually limited the number of people in the operating room. We also limited the number of people in the operating room, especially during intubation or extubation, which we felt were the most opportune time for the virus to be transmitted. And every patient who comes for surgery gets a COVID test. I can tell you, I know of zero patients that I know of on the neurosurgery service who have acquired COVID uh, while hospitalized. This continues to be a community acquired disease. Yes. Uh, and hospitals have, as you know, because you lived it, uh, I'm sure that you and your friends were part of the teams that came up with all these recommendations, hospitals have gone above and beyond, especially Hopkins, which you see us every night on the news with our logo yes. on, on the news in all over the world because of our public health uh, folks who are helping the world navigate this. I can tell you that at Johns Hopkins, I have no hesitancy in having surgery today at Johns Hopkins due to COVID. That says a lot, really does. As we close, I'd like to mention that some of our listeners are probably pregnant. And during pregnancy, low back pain can be a particular problem. I mention it because I don't want any pregnant gals out there thinking, well, I'm going to have to have surgery while I'm carrying my baby or surgery afterwards. So this is a, an unpleasant problem, but it is a temporary problem. But it can result in some pretty severe pain, but not necessarily needing to actually go into the operating room for sure. Yeah, but you know, Lily, I can think currently of at least four patients where I was operating and there was an OB obstetrician in the operating room managing some of the anesthesia and the oh, wow. listening to the uh, stomach. Yes. So if somebody comes, let's say, with a massive disc herniation and they have uh, compression sure. in their nerves and they lose ability to control their urine or bladder and they're mm -hmm. 33 years old and they're 32 weeks pregnant, we would take them to the operating room. And once again, this speaks to the multidisciplinary situations where we find ourselves often where we need all hands on deck. And at Johns Hopkins, you have very capable hands, whether it's from anesthesia to OB to uh, neurosurgery to nursing, which cannot be understated, to technologists who know what the surgeon needs and uh, what his or her desires are in order to keep the cases flowing. But 
you're absolutely correct. If you are pregnant and you have back pain, you have to tolerate it as much as you can. Uh, but in circumstances where we see that there's spinal cord injury or nerve injury, oftentimes we find ourselves in the operating room with our obstetrics and gynecology colleagues at the same time. Well, we are very thankful that you're part of our well-oiled machine within neurosurgery. And uh, I want to thank you again for taking time to participate today in this podcast. This has been very informative, and I think that it also provides our listeners a way to better understand what the spine does, why we need it to be in tip-top shape, and that as we get older, it can get a little finicky. We may need to do some non-invasive things and then in some cases, some invasive things. I've always said that if a person has never experienced back pain, they don't know what pain is. I am very empathetic to individuals that are experiencing that. I have experienced it. My husband's had surgery for it and that's why I know about the well-oiled machine too. So thank you so much for joining me today. Lily, thank you very much. If I could say one last thing for the audience, especially women over 50, take your vitamin D, take your calcium. We need those strong bones so we can avoid compression fractures, uh, which can lead to significant pain. Very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.